Isabel Roman Labau will defend the academic thesis patients derive neuronal models for pharmacogenetic pain treatment of sodium channelopathies. And to welcome, of course, and lots of success. Welcome also to the promotion team. That is uh, Professor Smith, Professor Faber, Dr. D. Hai, and Dr. Waxman, to the members of the opposition who you will all meet, and family and friends on site and online. And first, I would like to ask you to give a presentation of your work, which has been dealt with in your thesis. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and good morning for those of you joining us from overseas. And thank you for attending uh, my defense of the PhD thesis entitled Patient Derived Neuronal Models for Pharmacogenetic Pain Treatment of Sodium Channelopathies. Now I know that this title alone is good enough to give you a headache, and that's far from being my intention. On um, the contrary, I would like to explain how pain works. So let's change this title for something more around finding new ways to solving chronic pain. Throughout my PhD career and scientific career, every single time I've met a stranger, whether it be my Uber driver, someone at a party, and talked about my work, every single time without fail, they told me that they or someone that they knew was suffering from chronic pain. And this is not a coincidence, as chronic pain affects one in five individuals worldwide, making it one of the largest plagues afflicting humanity today. Furthermore, less than 50% of patients suffering from chronic pain report any form of effective treatment. Um, and those who do find response in treatments report terrible side effects. I'm sure all of you are aware of the opioid epidemic and importantly, opioids um, related addiction as well as uh, respiratory depression cause 350,000 deaths um, globally and are responsible for 70% of all drug-related deaths. Additionally, it's also a huge economic burden, costing the US alone or up to $635 billion every year. So collectively, chronic pain is an urgent problem to solve. So how do we solve this? Well, I like to flip the problem around, and rather than thinking of a world filled um, with people suffering from pain, how about we think of a world free of pain? That sounds pretty wonderful, doesn't it? Well, for some people, this world very much already exists. In a disorder called congenital insensitivity to pain, a genetic mutation causes patients to not feel anything pain related. Often we can see in babies that they chew off their fingers and their toes. They have spats carrying around the mouth as well. And because they can't feel pain, they don't seek medical treatment and ultimately, they have reoccurring injuries and are more likely to suffer from infections. This particular mutation is in sodium channels. There is a group of sodium channels and one in particular is responsible for pain. These sodium channels function like gates. When you feel something painful, let's say you prick your finger with a needle, though that sends an electric signal that goes through those gates. The signal goes through and goes all the way up to your brain and you start feeling pain. However, in patients with congenital insensitivity to pain, those gates are permanently closed. So no matter how strong the signal is, they won't ever get the message to their brain and so they won't feel a thing. So they could be stepping on thorns, boiling lavas and get stung by a thousand bees, no message will get to the brain and they won't feel a thing. The opposite is also true and with way more frequencies, Mutations in those same gates called gain of functions have been related to uh, several disorders, two of them which are related to burning hands and feet. These are paintings done by patients suffering from erythromyalgia and, um, and when they were asked to depict their disorder. So how do we try to solve this problem? Well, first of all, we should try to target those gates. And those gates could also be good to be targeted for pain in general, since they're so important as we've seen. And so among different types of gate blockers, one, lacosamide has raised some interest recently. It's mostly been used against epilepsy, but some recent studies have showed that uh, chronic, it could also be great for chronic pain. 
One study in particular looked at patients that had mutant gait causing them to have pain and gave them lacosamide, 50% of which responded to the drug and 50% did not. So we were wondering why exactly is that? Why patients with technically the same cause would respond differently to the same drug? Could these mutant gates not only cause people to feel pain, but also cause the drug to work better or worse? So that's what we did. There were 24 patients in these studies, and we focused on five different mutations from people that responded to treatment and others that did not respond to the treatment. And we basically took out those different mutations and put them into a cell and expose the cell to lacosamide. Now those cells are like a blank slate. All there is inside is that single mutation so that we are able to study nothing but that single mutation. And then we recorded the electricity as mentioned, it worked the pain signal function like electricity. And we actually found a match between the mutations carried by people who were responsive versus not responsive. And additionally, we were even able to find a signature signal only in patients that responded positively to the drug. So showing that maybe the mutation confer an additional aspect to the person, making them responsive to the treatment. But why did these mutations that did not work, not work? So could they actually be um, responsible for helping the for the drug to attach to the gate for the gate to be blocked. So using a supercomputer and super simulator, we looked at those gates and we uh, were able to test the drug that we are interested in, in this, this time lacosamide and see based on the composition of the gate, what place exactly it preferred to attach itself to. And we found that one of those mutations that were non-responsive was actually one of the favorite sites for lacosamide to attach itself to. So then we looked it into the same dishes like we did earlier. And so wondering where lacosamide goes, we considered other gate blockers, how they work. So lidocaine, for example, maybe you're familiar with it. That's a local anesthetic that can be used to put yourself or an area of your body to sleep before surgery. We know that lidocaine goes to on the top of the gate to block it. And then we looked at another drug, which is not on the market yet, that, but we know it goes on the side of the gate. We already know that the mutation that didn't work is at that same location. So that makes sense that that new drug wouldn't work and that maybe this site is important for lacosamide. And then through another mutation, we blocked the top of the gate as well. And we saw that lacosamide was not able to work when either of those sites was gone, meaning that lacosamide actually works differently from other blockers and that at least both these sites are important for it to work, which could have significance for patients being treated with this drug, especially if they have mutations at these particular locations. Importantly though, here we only looked at one single genes and there's over 20,000 genes in the human body. Additionally, we only looked at five mutations and over 100 million I've been uh, reported this far, and we're still studying. So it's very hard to think of a single mutation that can predict how any person can respond. We need to consider the entire genome, all of the genes, to really have a better idea if someone could or not respond to a drug. And there's a way to do that now, and it's stem cells. Well, when you think of stem cells, a lot of people still think about these ethical a debate about the use of stem cells because originally only from embryos they could be obtained. But now we can actually obtain stem cells from a small blood sample or from a small skin biopsy, which are both very non-invasive, and turn these into stem cells, which can then be used to make more stem cells or then be transformed into any cell type that we desire. In our case, we're interested in neurons because this is a neurological problem. So and what's also super cool about this is like they can be derived directly from a single patient rather than just be a random cell. Additionally, the gene from the patients or the individual the stem cells are taken from is preserved in those cells. So we can study any mutation that the patient already has and you also have the program to actually make these different genes work, which sounds like exactly what we need. However, they're not a perfect system yet, and they're quite immature still. They're lacking some important information in order to be 
quite like the patient's true neurons. Notably, among other things, they're like cell-to-cell -cell communications. So you need to think of a neuron within its real context. A context is never, uh, sorry, a neuron is never alone. There's other neurons and there's glial cells, supporting cells. There's an entire cellular network talking to each other to really carry the right information. And then that's within an organ and there's the entire body and everything in your body talks to each other. So it's important to have that context to fully develop. And also there's different types of gates. So I've talked about one in particular whose mutation is very bad for chronic pain, but really for pain, there's three different types of gates that are important to talk to each other to get an accurate signal. And in those stem cells derived neurons, two of them are actually missing. So the signal that we are recording when we're looking at the pain signal is not quite accurate. So to try to solve these issues, the first thing I did was related to cell-to-cell -cell communications. The idea was to inject human stem cells in a rat and then hopefully with the cellular context within an entire organism, we would get macho neurons. However, with that first try, what I obtained was a tumor because stem cells, if you don't tell them to become a neuron, they just spontaneously divide and divide and divide, and that leads to tumors. So I wasn't able to obtain mature neurons. And instead, what I did is like before I injected them, I told them you have to become neurons. I made them immature so that they still had a chance to get that information that they were missing from the rat, but without telling them too much. And so after injecting them, I was indeed able to get more mature neurons. Unfortunately, there were still a very low level of them, not enough to really conduct any future studies from those cells. Nonetheless, it was still very informative for stem cell therapy as this was the first time anyone had ever attempted to inject human stem cells in this particular pain center. So then trying to solve problem number two, which was the two important gates that were missing because it's not possible right now to just get them to work in stem cells, what we did instead is that we um, looked at human neurons and we actually looked, oh, sorry, the signal was poor then. So obviously it's just like you have several towers uh, connected to one another. If you cut up two, the signal is gonna be poor for the Wi-Fi. So to try to solve this issue, we looked at human neurons and we looked exactly how much electricity was needed for those two gates to work. And we calculated exactly how much electricity. And then from that information, we were able to artificially inject this electricity into the cells, creating kind of like phantom gates, not physically present, but still very much electricity wise. And then we were able to recover an appropriate signal. So this is great to study new mutations as before we were not able to even consider what those two other gates that are missing would do in stem cells. However, because this, the gates are not physically there, it's not possible to test treatments as the drugs need to attach themselves to the gates. Um, so to conclude, the answer to treating pain might already be written in our DNA, and that's why we kind of show in the first studies, setting, um, putting down a stepping stone for uh, correlating mutations and drug response, which in the future could be implemented into database. And the more we do this, the more information we have to genotype patients and then hopefully be able to link directly drugs that they are likely to respond to and not respond to. And finally, while there's still a long road to perfectioning human pain models, our studies with human stem cells were already also a breaking stone as we were the first to inject stem cells in the pain center. And now we are able to artificially modulate electric signals in stem cells, which can now change the landscapes of stem cells in pain research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Candidate Labau, we're now going to the opposition and the first opponent is also the chair of the assessment committee and he's, uh, that's Professor Joosten, he's a professor in experimental anesthesiology and pain management and for today he has also accepted the role of secretary of this committee for which I'm very grateful. Professor Joosten. Thank you. Uh, I would like to congratulate you with the beautiful thesis and, of course, uh, with this congratulation, also include uh, the promotion team. 
Uh, nevertheless, I'm here to discuss the contents of the thesis, and I would like to start with a general question, more general question, and related to the pain phenotype, because that's where it's all about, I think. Um, I fully agree with you, um, uh, the suggested route to personalized or precision uh, medicine, as you've chosen, and the fact that the translational research is indeed boosted by uh, the approach you have chosen with human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived sensory neurons. The translation from experimental to clinic is a major challenge in pain research, and finally, it all deals with effects on treatment of pain. And um, although it's of great interest to study effects of drugs on sodium channel variants, the role and the relation to the pain phenotype is, uh, is very important and an interesting challenge. Because maybe you know the paper, from uh, one of the co-authors, I think it's Mark Estacion already in 2011. Uh, for instance, a same mutation, the 1228M uh, sodium channel variant results in not only intrafamily, but also intrafamily phenotypic diversity in the pain syndrome. And uh, my question is, does that mean, or does it imply that other factors do play a role? And, uh, and which factors? Could you elaborate on that? And eventually also then include a, a more, let's say, a approach. How would you then uh, include that in your technical, uh, in a technical experiment or in the experiments itself? Um, thank you very much for your question. Uh, can I just try to clarify you asking me differences for the I228M for when it's congenital versus not like we see in small fiber neuropathy or? No, I, I'm, I'm referring to the paper from Mark uh, Estacion who, who showed that with, uh, with a one very precise mutation, the 1228M, not only inter, inter but also intra-family uh, presentation of the pain phenotype differs which is remarkable, in, at least in my opinion. Uh, and um, uh, you would expect, uh, let's say, a similar pain phenotype with such a precise, it does not happen. And then the question is, do other aspects, do other factors, are, are they involved? And not only the mutation of this particular sodium channel. Well, so, Obviously, coming back to the example I showed that when we look at a single mutation, we cannot expect to have all of the answers, considering that there's other variants that are all contributing. Um, from my lab as well, there's been two studies, notably looking at um, two different mutations that caused uh, erythromyalgia, and they showed pain differences in the pre different presentations, different frequency of pain between mother and son and between mother and daughter that was caused by a potassium channel variant. So I think whether it's between families or within the same families, there is other variants that definitely also play a role in modulating maybe that first variant's um, phenotype. There could be other mutations that, like we've seen in some patients, for example, even in one of the papers that I use, um, where there is multiple uh, NAV 1.7 mutations that could be altogether causing the pain phenotype or not. So I think there's just already genetic factors that can play a major role, but also environmental factors. And I don't really touch so much upon epigenetics in pain, but there's definitely been research showing that the environment, and we see that in pain patients even, like depending on which area they live in, how much they're supported by their family, all of this will change how they, um, how they perceive pain. So I definitely think that it's just like, um, what's the saying, a needle in a haystack when we look at a single variant and there's definitely a lot of other factors that can contribute. Okay, thank you. I, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. And I, I think, yes, uh, uh, of course you want to focus on that one single mutation, but additional factors might still be involved and, and, uh, and then attribute to the pain, uh, the pain phenotype, which we then uh, see differently between uh, even siblings uh, with that same mutation. Anyway, um, I do have a 
A second question, and that's related to, um, uh, to chapter two. Um, in general, in the paint field, uh, a paint treatment and a successful paint treatment is defined if uh, there is a 50% reduction on the visual analog score. Sometimes 30% is used, but in general, it's a 50%. Uh, in your study, in chapter two, uh, you present data uh, on clinical responses of patients uh, carrying the specific uh, sodium 1.7 variants and define the responders if there is a vast reduction of one point. And sometimes, for instance, in figure D, uh, there are four responders noted and one of them only uh, one point, which is maybe 10, 15% reduction, which in the clinic is not considered to be uh, a responder. Uh, so, and if you then go to the uh, figure A and, and look at the average of the reduction on VASCOR, that does never exceed 30%. So, in fact, what are we talking about here? And, um, and, and, and my question is now, um, should you not be more strict and say, okay, uh, these, which I, I would say is a minimal responder, in fact, a non-responder. And in fact, in the discussion on page 50, you, you uh, refer to these patients or some of these patients as a uh, lack of response and how to explain the lack of response to exclude them and uh, say, okay, I would better focus on real uh, responders. And that would then uh, give maybe different results. Could you comment on that? Um, okay, so to, to just go to the first point, I think the idea here was not necessarily to consider them responsive from a purely clinical point of view, as in the patient does significantly feel better, but rather uh, more in like, was the drug able to induce a form of a response? And that's why the point was lower than it would be maybe when treating a patient directly in the clinic in that sense that this was like a clinical study and not directly treating patients. So yes, I agree with you that with only one point response, that wouldn't be considered sufficient for the patient to, let's say, go on with this treatment. However, here it was really just to see, does this or not cause a change? And there are patients that did have a much bigger change and, and, and actually proper positive response. And I do agree that like maybe in future prospects, it would be interesting to maybe out of third category, which would be non-responsive, somewhat responsive. and well responsive to look at mutations. But do you think that would, would, would change the outcome of the results? Uh, uh, because uh, at the end, we want to have translational uh, uh, research. We want to have translation of the experimental findings to the clinic and the impact of the clinic. So um, what is your opinion about that? If I may, from the pro record, yes. I don't know if uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, yeah, running off time, certainly. I tried to say it before. So thank you for your position. And we now go to Professor Lampert, who's also a, a member of the assessment committee. And she's professor in physiology, in particular neurophysiology in the Uniclinic in uh, Aachen in uh, Germany. And we thank you for coming all the way, albeit online, because we're also always very glad to have guests from outside abroad. Right, thank you very much. And um, thank you, Ms. Candida, for this very clear presentation. I enjoyed reading your thesis a lot and also your presentation showed that you really understood what you're showing because in the moment that you can explain things in simple terms, um, it shows that you actually really master the things. Um, yeah, so I was very much intrigued by your idea to improve the IPS cell differentiation with using the animal. Um, and I would like to go a little bit into the IPS cell differentiations which are running in the moment. Because, I mean, in the human body, we, of course, have different types of C-fibers. And um, what kind of types do you think are you actually able to generate using the IPS cells? And do you think that these are really the cells, cell type that is then clinically relevant? I'm going to try to answer. I'm not sure I understood fully the question with the, the screen. So tell, correct me if I'm wrong in answering. Um, so if I understand clearly, what you mean is that 
because rodents obviously different from humans, then might not be getting the appropriate signal to produce um, C fibers. Was this the question? Um, I mean, this is uh, this could be one part of it, uh, which I also like. It's an interesting aspect. Uh, maybe just go ahead with this part, and then I will rephrase my other question again. Um, so, I'm really sorry. I feel like I I couldn't understand properly. Do you mind saying no. that's a little slower? I'm so sorry. Oh, sure, no problem at all. So, my question was that when you have iPS cells you are trying to derive sensory neurons from them, especially C fibers or nociceptors. Yeah. Um, what type of fibers or fiber classes do you think we can derive using the iPS cells? And I'm not specifically asking for your approach with the animal, but also for the other approaches which are used in more general, like in the Chambers protocol, the other protocols which are around um so since i tried this since i attempted the transplantation there has actually been two studies published uh which did um perform a similar approach um including a direct in vivo transplantation of uh neuroprecursor cells derived from ipscs and one ex vivo which have been informative they've not been pushed as far as i was hoping to bring mine but overall um depending on how far they are in the differentiation process so of course if we were to let's say fully differentiate them with our in vitro protocols um, we would get mostly nociceptors that are mostly non-peptidergic, which is what we get. And then hopefully by transplanting them, they would still manage to differentiate a little further. The idea here was to try to see how early we could get to, to provide them with all the information. So the expectation would be that we would obtain not only just nociceptors, but mechanoceptor, mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors, just like a wide range. And from the nociceptors, we would get non-peptidergic and peptidergic, which we are missing. And hopefully the big hope was they're so mature that they have functional NAV1.8 and NAV1.9. And so we can record uh, almost perfectly human neurons by, sure it's not the proper environment as this is a rodent. So it wouldn't be as obviously perfect as it would from humans, but hopefully there's enough similarity from the micro niche, the micro environment provided by the DRG that they would get to that um, mature level and a wide range of different types of sensory neurons. Right, yeah, yeah, I think the approach was very nice and I would have hoped that it would have gotten, um, helped better to receive the right classes. Now you said that you have the different sodium channels types and you already mentioned that um, they are not expressed equally among the different um, sensory fibers. What is the difference of the sen of the sodium channel subclass expression in the different fiber classes? Do you know anything about that? Um, I mean, so my work has really been focused on those receptors, so I feel like I'm not as I'm not going to be able to give you the exact numbers on percentages um, from the different subtypes. Um, I definitely know that 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9 are very important for pain transmission, so they are heavily expressed in those receptors. Um, I think there is some NAV1.1 and NAV1.6 that are also expressed in some other fiber subtypes, maybe more. Um, I'm not too sure if it's making a receptor or proprioceptors, um, but th there are definitely differences, and um, those three channels we have mostly focused on because they are altogether fundamental to get an appropriate pain signal, um, which is something that we also went on to study um, in uh, IPSs derived sensory neurons by in, in human DRGs by looking at what exactly was the contribution of 1.8 and 1.9 in initiating action potentials and the current, et cetera. That is right. So um, you in your approach, you were focusing on NAV 1.7. Um, there are a couple of approaches where they, people are trying not only to focus on 1.7, but also on, for example, 1.8 or 9, as you mentioned. Why, why do you think 1.7 would be more advantageous um, compared to the others? 
terms of IPACs, the, the main advantage is that it's the only pain channel that's functionally working. So 1.8 and 1.9 have been expressed with mRNA, but we've from at least our lab, when we've tried to, to isolate currents from them, like they've defined TX resistant currents, but that was later found to be mostly NAV 1.5 related, which is found in immature neurons. And so 1.8 and 1.9 do not seem to be functionally expressed. So when we record the current from IPACs for pain, it's NAV 1.7 kind of driving the car by itself, mostly. So it's not that we're trying to focus on 1.7, it's just that it's the one that's, that's here. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lampert, for your position. Then we go to the third opponent, that's Professor Walker. She's also a member of the assessment committee and she's a professor in pediatric anesthesia and pain medicine in the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child, Child Health in London. And thank you, Professor Walker for coming all the way as well, albeit online. Thank you very much. And I just want to congratulate you as well on a, an excellent thesis and also for focusing on such a very important topic. Um, I uh, do a mix of clinical work. And so if I was in clinic next week with one of the parents of, of my children who have an uh, you know I848T mutation, what would you tell them about the sort of future advances coming out of your research and the sort of potential timelines? What do you think will be the first, the subsequent, the future advances? Um, thank you. This is a great question and obviously a tough question. I've, I've learned very early on from my wife's supervisors that um, discussing pain with patients is uh, difficult and um, can be dangerous path because obviously it's a terrible disease and the advances we all wish would be faster. Um, so I, I've been focusing more on a personalized approach. And I think this is, we've been trying the one size fit all type of treatments for so long with very uh, poor success. So um, in terms of timeline, if we were to all focus our efforts, let's say in genotyping patients and trying to find correlations with treatment responses. First of all, there would be probably a lot of preclinical work and then before we can move on to patients, unless let's say doctors or clinicians start would start making notes and put it on a big database. So there would be a lot of factors to be put into place to get to that moment where we can just look at someone's DNA and be like, well, there's a good chance that this will work and that you'll tolerate it well. Um, so if there's children um, I would need to talk to, I would um, tell them to stay hopeful and uh, that we are working really hard to try to uh, better understand how pain works and how to, to uh, find treatments. And um, when they're old enough, they can contribute to science and sign up to trials as well and hopefully find something for themselves. And uh, um but yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could say it's going to be in a decade. I don't know. Science is also going so fast. So the past 10 years have been crazy on ex exponential advances. So it's hard to put a date, but I would be, I would be hopeful that in their lifetime, there will be something for, for them and for others suffering from their condition. And anything you could tell them specifically about, about you know, a NAV 1.7 mutation? Um, I mean, like uh, our lab does focus a lot on those more rare conditions. Um, so there is definitely a possibility to, like, especially if they're signed up and put into the system as, okay, that you have this mutation, we're going to look at it. So like within just our lab, like in terms of if we were to focus on their mutation, uh, if we look at just some hex cells to see what that individual mutation does, and let's say to different treatment, like we did in chapter two, um, it could be very quick, just a couple of months if we want to uh, look at stem cells. Um, obviously, that takes a much longer time to get them to from 
let's say a skin sample to stem cells and then to neurons. Um, but but things are going way faster. Like we, there's more and more high throughput uh, methods where we could be potentially testing stem cells from a patient against a thousand different compounds. So um, at an individual level, if they found the right lab, like our lab, the, the Waxman lab, it could be very fast for them to find a match. Great, thank you. And just um, uh, just another quick question. I mean, you showed really well that, you know, targeting the conserved pore and the voltage sensing domain um, increased sensitivity. And you also mentioned that it will be associated with fewer undesirable side effects. And I just wondered, you know, how you would test that and which side effects you'd be most concerned about. Well, so when we look at sodium channel blockers, what's uh, important to remember is that sodium channels are expressed throughout the body, including the brains, the heart, muscles, spinal cord. So when we have an unspecific um, sodium channel blocker, we have risks of like uh, cardiac related risks and uh, brain related, like over diseases that could come out. Um, so by finding a highly specific channel, uh, sorry, and a highly specific blocker. And that's something that let's say we could do in iPSCs. With CRISPR technology now, we have the possibility of just uh, knocking out the channel that it's supposed to specifically target. Let's say NAV 1.7, we can knock it out and see if there is any change in the um, recordings from those cells, in which way that means that uh, the blocker is not specific. And then eventually, when we're pretty confident that it works in cells in iPSCs, then it's possible to then go back to the clinic and test them in, let's say, the patient that uh, has provided those stem cells and see how they're feeling and what side effects they have in that case. So do you think it's the channel or the distribution of the channels that's most important? So, I mean, th there's different aspects for like uh, side effects. So there's like just from like having too many targets that could cause side effects. And then there's also how the drug is metabolized. And there is actually also polymorphisms for other pain genes that are like linked to more, and not only pain genes, but also overall metabolism of a drug. So by looking also at these factors, we could have a fairly good idea on how a patient might react. But ultimately, you know, we can take as many precautions as we can to make sure the drug is safe, at least before being given to patients. Uh, but then ultimately, the idea would be to know how uh, a patient will react to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Walker, for your position. Then we come to the fourth opponent, who is also a member of the assessment committee, that's Dr. Pishva. He's assistant professor in integrated genomics of neurodegenerative disorders in the University of Maastricht. Dr. Pishva. Thank you very much. I would like to express uh, that how much I enjoyed reading your thesis. It's a very coherent and uh, focused thesis. Uh, congratulations. Uh, my question is generally about the iPSC sensory neurons that you were differentiating for the different chapters here. So you correctly listed a number of sources for variations. Uh, and I'm mainly focusing on the molecular variations that can be <clears throat> caused uh, by person-specific cultures, differentiation, and epigenetically. There's a study in 2018 by Schwarzen and yeah, that they uh, tried to characterize the signature, the molecular signature, apart from the functional part, the molecular signature of the sensory neurons for mm -hmm. small term and also iPSC drive. Mm -hmm. Right. I would like to ask you that how would you design differently that study to improve the characterization of the IPSC derived signature to use it as a as a as a, a method for characterization of your model mm. that you can in the context of the somatic memory and also distinct signature of some uh, sensory motors, uh, sensory neurons, sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
so from what I can recall from my study, I don't mm -hmm. remember all of the methods perfectly. So um, I would say uh, in line with your question that I think this study could be continued to maybe include functional characterization to some extent, um, which obviously would present itself in different ways depending on what we're looking at. So if we're looking at ion channels, we could perform electrophysiology. Um, because I think a big issue that has been especially for us um, is not so much the lack of expression of um, mRNA or genes, which are often looked at, but rather the functional expression of proteins, which is hard to know until, um, I mean, potentially immunohistochemistry could be used for, but I know that there's a lot of debate around how accurate our antibodies um, and also like electrophysiology are examples that come to mind there are just so many other genes and mRNAs that are uh, reported that I cannot on top of my head come up with all the solutions but I would um, I would definitely try to ex further extend study um, sequencing whole exome sequencing and um, RNA sequencing that uh, have been performed by this type of studies I am not an expert in, so I would uh, hardly criticize their technique in that regard, but I would uh, potentially expand on their findings. How would you rule out or like exclude the signature, the somatic mm -hmm. memory of the original or the source of the IPSC? Okay. What can you think of uh, to add to the design? Mm. For um, example. So differentiate between uh, Let me give you a hint. So what they have done, they have done from a, a, a number of patients, post-mortem sensor morons, mm. and with a different source uh, of origin of like the different individual, they generated IPSC. Oh, right. Well, yeah. So uh, that is actually something I suggest that it would be good to uh, obtain IPSCs and post-mortem neurons from the same patients. And maybe the fibroblasts. And what? Maybe the fibroblasts. That yeah, absolutely, the of the absolutely. IPC. I mean, if I mean, especially if they're already dead, you can. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I mean, ideally, you know, that would be good if they were alive and donors to to be able to obtain blood samples like fibroblasts, keratinocytes, um, uh, from them and differentiate them into iPSCs and then postmortem be able to directly compare iPSCs derived sensory and say neurons to the neurons of the patients that they often put postmortem or individuals that don't necessarily have to be, uh, actually probably would be better to have healthy individuals in that case to really compare the levels um, than, than patients. And, and, and that would actually really be great in the future to, to have a, a good idea of what's really lacking compared to human, again, here let's say neurons, but it could be used for anything else. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pishfa. Then we come to the following opponent, who's also a member of the assessment committee, that's Professor Van Zundert, is a professor in pain medicine in the Maastricht University Medical Center. Professor Van Zundert. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Also from my side, uh, congratulations for the nice work of the candidate of the whole promotion team. And glad to see you at least uh, digital in Maastricht again now. I want to discuss a couple of uh, issues with you, probably related to the more clinical applications. First of all, you performed a number of relevant experiments showing as the value of bench research to create insights into the basic principles of the pathophysiology of pain. Moreover, you present some positive examples of success stories of pharmacogenomics and precision medicine. However, we are all aware about negative examples in the field in the last 20 years. The majority of the pharmacological pain trials in pain were negative. So is there any means to make the road to precision medicine more predictable? Who gave the basis for it? What can you, how can we improve it further? Thank you. This is a really great question. Um, that I might need to think about as I'm trying to answer it. <laughs> um, so a lot of those uh, studies that, um, successful or not, that used pharmacogenomics, um, 
Well, so on two hands, there's pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. So looking at single variants, like we might have done in our studies versus the entire genome. And then within those genomes, there's a lot of different things to think about. So let's break it down to two main boxes. There is how well are they going to tolerate the drug? Are they going to not have any response or, or like, so if they're going to be resistant to the drug, are they going to feel sick? Uh, uh, there's actually three boxes and then there's a dosing, which could also vary based on their um, variants. And finally is, is it effective or not? Which is kind of like how trial, clinical trials are already broken down. And we would ideally try to do the opposite where we already can predict, is, it, is the drug safe? Are they going to tolerate it well? And uh, are they going to be uh, responding successfully? So a good way, I don't know if it's good, it's very cumbersome for sure, is to actually be able to figure out um, exactly which genes to look at and which variants are actually more important within those genes as predictors of tolerability and efficacy. And uh, rather than looking at a single variant, which is often what those studies did like they looked, for example, at SIP uh, D26. I could be saying a wrong number. I forgot the number. And that was the main driver of finding whether the patients were going to respond well or not. And instead, maybe having several different variants that are key in how the patient will respond to better predict how they will respond. Is that? Okay. Is that so you... It's already the beginning. It's uh, rather broad. You're doing now. Uh, you're finishing now your PhD today. You will work as a post uh, PhD, a postdoc researcher. What will be your golden target to continue and to improve the precision medicine? There... This uh, kind of topic. If you're allowed to say um... that from your uh, chairs, of course. But we need to, we need to come a little bit more to to the practical details. How can we improve it? What went wrong in the last twenty years? Um, well, so I think following a clinical and preclinical approach in parallel could be extremely helpful. From the clinical side, having a large group of individuals and patients with chronic pain, let's say even more specifically NAV 1.7 related pain, let's say. And we have, uh, we can genotype all these patients and actually isolate key variants, um, whether, so let's say sodium channel related, pain sodium channel related, so in 1.7, and in 1.9, uh, also metabolism related, for example, with SIP. Um, and so once we have analyzed this data, we can look at the history of the medications that they've taken and take track as well on how they might have responded differently, including side effects um, and efficacy of these different treatments and what they have not tried. Uh, and in parallel, we would be able to conduct a preclinical studies looking at variants such as the ones that we studied in chapter two, but through an eye throughput automated machine that can then look at those all these different variants that we suspect to be uh, altering different drugs and be testing it against different compounds. And then we could study the preclinical to the clinical in parallel and return back to the clinical with what we hope would be more likely to work treatments for those patients. How long do you think it will take this cycle? Can you predict it? How long Sorry, it will understand. take? A couple of years? Oh, how long, how long? Do, you, do you oh. think it will take this cycle? Well, I mean, with the clinical several years <laughs> and uh, probably similar for the preclinical which is why it would be helpful to have in parallel and probably would take a team of more than one as well <laughs> so, um, so whole, this is you have a whole career to go so you you will have work, work enough um, <laughs> i want to uh, if i'm still allowed to ask a second question about the discussion yes certainly this this time okay uh, as you mentioned in your nice discussion, which was really nice written, thank you, a number of confounding factors can influence the pain sensation in individual, individual patients. That's our daily uh, problem in dealing with uh, pain patients. You already referred to personalized medicine and pain dynamics, but do you think we should implement routine broad psychological research and combine this with the pharmacogenetics? Would that be an interesting uh, way to go? 
Um, thank you. I'm I'm not sure I got everything, so I'll try to rephrase to make sure that this is what you meant. Um, you you want to see how we can incorporate um, symptoms that like so em the emotional and psychological component to the pharmacogenomics approach. First of all, I congratulated you with your discussion. Second, I mentioned the complexity of the pain sensation in individual patients. And indeed, then is the question, how can we improve uh, that aspect? And is it an option to combine psychological research with pharmacogenetics? That was mainly the point I tried to ask you. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is very important and there's been a lot of um, studies and work done uh, focusing on the psychology and the emotional component of pain and, and some patients have seen great results from uh, therapeutic, well, therapy support. Um, so, and, and there are also variants associated with that can make someone, let's say, with depressive tendencies more likely to develop chronic pain. Um, so on one hand, it is fundamental to incorporate this aspect into uh, patient's treatment. On the other hand, when we think of pharmacogenomics, it does at some point become very difficult to include every, because at, at, at some point it starts to include every single variance that makes us us. And, and, it, and I don't think we'll ever get to a perfect system where we can simply say for sure this drug will work for you. We can only say this is there's a good chance. Are you aware of uh, research that is already done in this way? Or would it be totally new? Uh, regarding the therapy? Yeah. Uh, I, I I've not conducted any myself. I've 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 heard and read over over work. Okay. On uh, page one sixty one, you refer even to popula population genomics, which is a uh, really interesting uh, idea of concept. Uh, any idea how to implement that? Because in terms of methodology of research, that would be a rather uh, challenge, I think. Absolutely. I think such a thing would be a combined effort of multiple groups. And um, But I, I do believe that um, personal, personalized medicine is the best strategy to go. And so having combined efforts from clinicians reporting back to, let's say, a database or some system that can catalog um, different variations for patients that have been genotyped and treated with different medications, we can hopefully sort out the data to then find specific variants that have been shown to be particularly good or bad for certain treatments. So on one hand, if clinicians could come play the game of, of reporting how their genotype patients respond and also having several labs working on uh, genome-wide association studies, also, eventually we could get to a level where we have a lot of information on a lot of different variants and their likelihood to respond to different treatments, but that will have to be a global effort, yes. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the rest of your research career, and I give the word back to uh, the <laughs> pro-rector. Thank you, Professor von Zundert. Now we come to the following opponent, that's Dr. Gorgos. He's senior scientist in glaucoma research in the University Eye Clinic in Maastricht. Dr. Gorgos. Thank you, Mr. Pro Rector. Uh, Mrs. Candidate, congratulations with your achievement. Uh, it is a very, very nice and interesting thesis. Despite COVID, I presume uh, you, you will have had trouble from that. Um, your thesis contains many interesting questions. I want to focus on how to create um, in vitro disease models for human diseases and of course, we want them to be realistic and uh, even, if possible, patient-specific. And um, for your disease you're investigating, uh, you, you have difficulty obtaining patient cells from patients. Um, the sensory neurons are not easily obtained. Uh, and iPSC technology can provide a new opportunity. Um, Pluripotent cells are pluripotent, so in principle, they can become 
any cell. That's the principle. And that the practice is a little bit more difficult. And uh, currently, I think there are uh, sufficient protocols to generate immature, immature sensory neurons, but to generate the full complement of different types of sensory neurons to, mature, to maturity is still not quite possible. And uh, I was charmed by your uh, chapter four in which you have, a, uh, in which you show two creative approaches to tackle that problem. And what I want to ask you is to briefly explain what you did and then, and I, I can already say you largely failed, you've had limited success. Could you please indicate what you think is the most important obstacle for reaching your goals of mature heterogeneous uh, population of sensory neurons? Thank you very much. This is a very good question and uh, indeed a problem I've been trying to tackle. Um, so uh, essentially the idea was I've looked through many, many papers that um, did transplantations of stem cells into different organs. Um, at the time I'd looked at it, the DRG, so the dorsal root ganglion, so one of the main pain centers, uh, wasn't one of them. And in particular, I was very interested by one study which uh, injected uh, undifferentiated IPCs into the brain and were able to get mature neurons, no tumors and or cancerous lesions for up to a year after transplantation. So I was very hopeful I could somehow do something similar. And so many studies had looked at um, pre-differentiated cells. So let's say pre-differentiated neurons injected into the brain or the spinal cord but their research questions often deferred, um, which was not to obtain mature uh, sensory neurons, but rather um, for stem cell therapy, for example, um, where sometimes they could even inject mature cells into the rodents and back out to just test how they would react. And I knew from at least over 50% of papers, if not more, that undifferentiated stem cells were very likely to cause uh, the tumor, tumor development. Um, so I actually attempted different things. And so I knew that the kind of like the best cocktail for getting tumors were uh, immune deficient animals, undifferentiated stem cells. Um, but there was also a risk of reject. So I did try both ways. I did try to inject undifferentiated into immune, um, uh, immunocompromised and immuno. Um, non-compromised animals. And what happened was the, the ones that were immunocompromised did get tumors and the ones that were not, um, that couldn't find any cells. So essentially rejected uh, the transplantation and was uh, getting rid of by their immune system. Um, but I wanted to inject undifferentiated to give them the full chance to be purely induced a neuronal fate from their environment and nothing else. Because I wasn't successful, then I tried the second option that I'd seen, which was to pre-differentiate them into neuroprecursor cells and then inject them. You may finish it. Okay, honest. thank you. Uh, so to inject them. So I'll, I'll just maybe move on to the second part of your question, uh, which is, I think I failed for several reasons, um, including um, the fact that it requires a lot a lot of cells and it's been done mostly in the brain which has a much bigger capacity to be receiving a lot of cells which wasn't the case with the dorsal root ganglion i do think that i was very close to um, getting cells and being able to record them but due to the pandemic everything had to be rushed and i think that in particular with the x fever there was more hope because there was no worries about rejection or immune or tumor development. So um, I would try to expand higher cell numbers ex vivo in DRG neurons to, to try to get that. And, um, and yeah. I settle for that. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorgels, for your position. And uh, Mrs. Labau, the time appointed for the defense of thesis has now passed and the degree committee will withdraw 
to discuss the quality of your thesis and of your defense. And so we request that you and your company await the, re the results of our deliberations and uh, our return in this room. And with that, I suspend the meeting.
turn out it'll work. I think is I'm drinking, you know, yes, it is good. All of it. I reopen this uh, academic session. And Miss uh, Julie Isabel Roman Labau, the degree committee here present, has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Smith is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Uh, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. Um, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Julie Isabel Roman Labau, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Professor Waxman, you're going to give the last yeah? Yeah, Dr. Waxman, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, it's an immense pleasure to make some laudatory remarks about Julie Labau as she reaches this new uh, and very positive transition and finishes her PhD uh, work. Uh, Julie, in a word, is a very special person. Don't ever forget that, Julie. Um, Julie's work in the laboratory is both impressive and important. Uh, in her two first author papers, she's done a wonderful job at dissecting the pharmacogenomics of a relatively new drug, lacosamide, that may add to the armamentarium of physicians who treat pain. Uh, we need more drugs in that armamentarium and you're helping to create that, that pipeline. Uh, and Julie has taken on the, the really important question, why is this medication effective in some patients and not in others? Uh, this is a key question throughout clinical medicine, certainly throughout the, uh, pain medicine and uh, using uh, genomics as well as sophisticated ion channel physiology, Julie's work has begun to unravel the mystery of at the genetic level of why some people respond to particular pain medications while others do not. And this work is not just intellectually beautiful, it's intellectually very beautiful, but it could apply to real patients and it can help us move closer to a new era of uh, a genomically guided personalized treatment for pain. That's where we hopefully are, are headed. We wanna turn pain medicine from trial and error into genomically guided uh, uh, DNA-based uh, uh, medicine. And Julie's work is helping to propel us in that direction. Uh, in Julie's second first author paper, uh, she continues this work, but takes on another challenge. And here uh, she has engaged in a dissection of the sodium channel that is blocked by lacosamide 
Uh, and she asks, how does leucosamide work to block the activity of, of sodium channels to quiet them down? Uh, most drugs work by attaching uh, like a key and a lock to a piece of the target molecule. Uh, and that's called the receptor. And uh, the receptor for leucosamide has been enigmatic. Uh, Julie's work begins to get us there. It's an important step toward finding and defining that receptor. And that is important as we think not only about leucosamide and how it works, but as, also as we think about the future and rationally, rationally discovering or building additional new pain medications. Um, this is a large and impressive body of work uh, and Julie can feel very proud of it. In my view, it is enough to uh, uh, merit a, a doctoral degree, but, but there's more. Uh, Julie contributed to research reported in several other uh, uh, published papers on sodium channels, and each of those papers uh, was important. Uh, Julie did important work on cells, including the maintenance of stem cells, uh, hex cells, which are a platform that we use for studying uh, new drugs, uh, and she did some very important work, unpublished still, on uh, pluripotent stem cell uh, transplantation. Uh, as you heard from Julie, these pluripotent stem cells from humans provide an experimental model. Each of them contain, each of the cells contains the 23,000 genes of the donor. And uh, Julie designed very uh, uh, important new experiments, uh, uh, adjusting protocols uh, in an attempt to improve on this technology. Uh, that work is going to continue in the future, uh, but it's important to point out that uh, uh, Julie designed those experiments, uh, did them from scratch, uh, and that will be a, a contribution to pain research. So I want to congratulate Julie on a really uh, very, very successful research performance and the beginning of a PhD career uh, as a uh, biomedical researcher. Um, I want to say just a few words about Julie's background. Um, I, I asked Julie, how did you get here? How did you get to graduate school? What, what moved you to go on this path. And what she told me is that she's the first person in her family to go to graduate school. And when I asked why biomedical sciences, what she told me is that she selected medical biosciences because she wants to better understand disease and participate in the development of therapeutics for afflictions that all of us suffer from. Uh, and she told me that uh, in part, uh, her interest in pain was triggered by an episode in House MD. Uh, it certainly is a, a very fortunate episode because you've made contributions to, uh, to pain research that are gonna be important. Uh, during her training, uh, uh, Julie has worked at Maastricht University, uh, the Hospital San Rafael in uh, uh, Milan, University uh, of Queensland, and at Yale. And so you come out of this with a very strong uh, uh, ensemble of trainings. Uh, and uh, things always are in evolution for the future. But when I asked Julie about her plans, uh, what she told me is she wants to bring a one health approach to research and incorporate even environmental issues into dealing uh, with disease. And you heard Julie talk about epigenetic factors, environmental factors, as well as genetic factors uh, in pain uh, and in other disease. Uh, Julie is committed to helping other uh, young women become uh, STEM leaders. Uh, she really is a role model in that way. Uh, and her long-term objectives, she told me, are to start her own research center in a university or a company uh, and keep advocating for uh, conservation, uh, for health, and for women uh, in STEM. And uh, that's a tall order, Julie, but I know you will succeed. So Julie, uh, we are very proud of you and we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Waxman, for this nice laudation. Uh, dear Dr. Uh, Labar, also on behalf of the Board of Deans of the University of Maastricht, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. I hope you can celebrate it in the right way, and I hope that you have a great career 
I also congratulate your team, Professor Smeets, Professor Faber, Dr. Dip Hai, and Dr. Waxman, and of course, uh, family and friends and all who are watching this uh, PhD session online. I want to thank the opponents for all their work and the preparations, and of course, Luc Peter, Joshua for Fedu, and the Padel for making this uh, hybrid session possible. So we are almost closing the session now. Uh, what we are going to do is uh, we will stop the, st the streaming, and then we will make a picture here with the other guests online. The audience may already leave this room, except of course for the photographer. <laughs> and then and then we will go to the stairs where we make another picture, and then we go to the reception outside the rafter. Okay, having said it all, I close this meeting.